I've heard worse. <laughs> Wasn't that great? Would you let them know again how much you appreciate uh, that and that great, great music? Well, uh, it's a joy to be down here in uh, Warner Robins. Uh, just like to know who I'm preaching to. How many of you, and if you're not, don't raise your hands, okay? How many of you are Georgia fans? Don't, don't, if you're not, don't raise your hands. Let me look around. Okay, I'm trying to see. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, I'm counting all the lost people in the room. So that's a, a big help. I have to tell you, it was a joy to come in and see all the bulldog paraphernalia in uh, the pastor's office. I'm a, a big bulldog fan. I was born and raised in Gainesville, just outside of Athens, and, and uh, grew up with, uh, with the bulldogs. Live about 25 minutes outside of Athens, have season tickets, been going forever and ever. And uh, so, um, I, uh, and first of all, I'm glad to be, and I know this is kind of Georgia Bulldog country. I know that as well. Second thing is, um, for those of you, some may remember, I don't know, but I actually got to preach back when uh, Brother Salter was pastor in the old church. I've not been in this church. And I kind of tell you how I got to be here tonight. I think you deserve to know. I heard about what a beautiful building you have and, and, and what a great location that you have and what great people you are. I knew that. And so... About, I don't know, three years ago, I called Jim, and I said, Jim, I said, man, I'd, I'd really like to come preach for you. He said, James, you're not ready, and hung up. So it was kind of disappointing, a little bit deflating, and so um, I gave it about six months. I called him back. I said, Jim, I said, hey, man, I'd, I'd really love to come preach for you. There was a pause, and he said, James, you're not ready, hung up. So about... I don't know, a year and a half ago, called, same thing, Jim, I really do want to come preach. I love Warner Robins, I love Houston County, I love your church, I loved your, you know, Brother Salter, and, and I'd really like to come preach. And third time, he said, James, you're just not ready. So six months ago, I called Jim, and I said, Jim, I said, let me tell you something. I said, I want to come to your church so badly that if you'll let me come, I'll pay my own way, no honorarium. He said, James, you're ready. So that's how I got here. I just, you need to know in all fairness, that's kind of how I got asked to come down here and preach. Well, if you brought a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to the book of Mark. If you kind of don't know much about the Bible, the Bible's divided into two testaments, old and new. The new begins with four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm in Mark chapter 4. When you come to a place like this, you don't know what's been preached. You don't know what the people have been hearing. So what I've learned in my ministry is there are certain messages you know will always fit. They will always go, and you're going to find out why in just a moment. But I want to take you back 27 years ago to October 1991 to Andrea Gale, a 72-foot-long fishing boat with a 365-horsepower turbocharged diesel engine leaves a New England port headed for the Atlantic Ocean. It was going on what was supposed to be just another routine fishing trip, but it was to be her last voyage. She would never come back. And the reason is because she ran into the most powerful and the most dangerous force on planet Earth, a full-blown hurricane on the ocean seas. Now, let me tell you how powerful an ocean hurricane is. It's more powerful than a current hurricane that hits land. An ocean hurricane is so powerful this is amazing to me, that the combined nuclear arsenals of the United States and the former Soviet Union do not contain enough energy to keep that hurricane going for one day. One average hurricane, listen to this, one average hurricane encompasses a million cubic miles of atmosphere and can provide all the electrical power that we use in this country for four years. Winds can be so high. They have been known that to hit the coast of, of a country, and people have been sandblasted to death. So much rain can fall up to five inches an hour. Birds have been known to drown in mid-flight as the water clogs their nostrils and are facing upward. So the Andrea Gale had the misfortune of running into a storm that was, listen to this, the name of it was Hurricane Grace. It was a storm that was so powerful. It had, to this day, it had the highest significant wave heights ever measured, ever measured since 1899. It was made into a movie, made into a book. You may have seen it. It was called The Perfect Storm. This storm brought waves 10 stories high with pressures up to six, towns, six tons per square 
foot of water. The winds were measured at 120 miles an hour. That boat never had a chance, never had a shot. They were dead when they cast off into the water because they had run into the perfect storm. Well, 2,000 years ago, in the Sea of Galilee, there was a storm that I call the first perfect storm. And it was important for this reason, not because it was as violent, because it wasn't, but it was far more important. Because that storm 2,000 years ago taught 12 disciples then, and hopefully will teach us tonight, how to navigate the ship of our life as we navigate through the stormiest of seas. Because I'm going to tell you something you learn pretty quickly after you begin to grow up. Nobody has a life of all sunshine and no rain. Nobody has a life of, of um, all loss, uh, 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 no loss and all gain. As the poet said, into every life some rain must fall. And by the way, that also includes thunder and lightning. So the question I want to ask is this. When you go through the storms of life, and you will, as a matter of fact, one of three things are true about everybody in this room right now. You are either about to go into a storm, you are in the middle of a storm, or you're just coming out of one. So when those storms hit, how do you navigate through it? How do you make sure you make it through the storms of life? And I promise you, I don't know where you're sitting, I don't know who you are, but there's some people in this room right now, and here's what you're saying. Do I ever need to hear this message? How did you know that I was in a storm? I didn't. I just know people are. So in this story in Mark chapter 4, I want to share with you three simple things that will help you navigate the ship of your life through any storm that you'll go through. All right? Very simple. Number one, remember the promise of Jesus. Remember the promise of Jesus. We're in verse 35, Mark 4. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Now, I've been to the Sea of Galilee about 28 times. And if you've ever, never been, you really do need to go. It is really one of the most beautiful bodies of water that you'll ever see. But Jesus gets into this boat. I've been in, this, in a fishing boat like this many, many times. And Jesus gets into this boat, and he just makes a simple statement. Let us cross over to the other side. Now, that's one of those statements that you read it and you don't really think that much about it. And you say, okay, let's go on to the other side. But that was a big statement because it wasn't just a statement. It was a promise. And it was a prophecy. When Jesus said, hey, let's cross over to the other side. I want you to listen to me. At that moment, there was no way that boat was not going to make it to the other side. Because Jesus never prophesied something that didn't come true. Jesus never promised something he didn't deliver. When Jesus made a promise, you could take it to the bank. His statement was always a guarantee. Now, we have a problem with that because I promise you this. Everybody in this room has made a promise you couldn't keep. Everybody. I heard about a, a, a little boy one time that was playing with a kid down the street. And he came home and he walked into the house and his dad was sitting in the easy chair. And he said, Dad... He said, I just got through playing with Johnny. He said, Johnny has his, 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 he lives, you know, down the street. You know what Johnny's daddy said? And he said, no. He said, Johnny's daddy said, he's got a list of men he can whip, and you're on that list. He said, really? He said, as a matter of fact, he said, you're the first name on the list. He said, where does this kid live? He said, about four houses down the street. So he walked out of his house. He walked down the street. He knocked on the door. Johnny's, dad, uh, Johnny's buddy's dad came to the door, and he said, uh, are you uh, Billy's dad? And he said, well, yes, I am. He said, I understand you got a list of men that you can whip. He said, I do. He said, I understand I'm the first name on the list. He said, you are. He said, I don't think you can do it. He said, okay, I'll take your name off the list. We have all, we have all made promises that we couldn't keep. Jesus, however, never did that. His commandments are always his enablements. I heard a man say one time, if Jesus says an elephant's going to lay an egg, get out the skillet. It's going to happen. When he makes a promise, he is going to keep it. So the minute that Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side, the devil couldn't stop that ship. Demons couldn't stop ship, that, that ship. Caesar could not stop that ship. The Roman army could not stop that ship. Nothing could have stopped that ship. Let me tell you why. If the boat hadn't made it, then Jesus would have been a liar. If the boat hadn't made it, then Jesus would have been a liar. And I got some news for you. The sun will stop shining, and the moon will stop glowing, and the stars will stop twinkling, 
and the wind will stop blowing, and the waves will stop crashing before one promise of Jesus Christ will ever fail. Now, here's another reason why I know the ship couldn't go down. Here's another reason why I know that they could not drown. They could not drown because they were with Jesus, and he couldn't drown. You say, well, James, he was a man like you and I were, right? Yes. Well, how do you know he couldn't drown? I know he could not drown because of the purpose and the promise and the plan of his heavenly Father. Because he had not yet been nailed to the cross. He had not yet shed his blood. He had not yet been buried in a tomb. He had not yet been raised from the dead. He had not yet ascended to the Father. So he could not drown. And neither could they. They had his promise. We're going to cross over to the other side. I read a story, a true story, about an old grandmother. She lived in an English town many, many years ago. And she lived with one of her sons, and she was too ill to really do much. She would just kind of sit in a rocking chair uh, just about all day, and she'd just read her Bible. That's all she was able to do. And so often she would be reading her Bible, and many, many times she would just go to sleep. She'd doze off, and her glasses would just kind of fall on the Bible in her lap. But every day she'd read her Bible, and every day she would pray. And she would always talk with a glow on her face, and she had just a radiant love for Christ. And what she would say to her kids and her grandkids all the time, she was always talking about the promises of God. Look what God promised here, and look what God promised there, and look what God promised here, and look what God promised there. Well, one day, she went into that sleep from which physically one of us will go in, all of us will go into one day, and she didn't wake up from it. And she went to be with the Lord. And that Bible was open on her lap of that now empty body. Well, they had her funeral, and of course the Bible, as you can imagine, became a treasured family heirloom. And so one day her, her son and his wife began to read that Bible. And, and they were so interested that they began to notice in the margins of the Bible, she had written down th th this little phrase, T and P, T and P, T and P. They didn't know, what, what does that mean? I mean, they wouldn't hardly go a page or two. There'd be T and P, T and P, T and P. They were trying to figure out, what does this mean? And, and then one day, they, they realized that every time she wrote those words, T and P, it was always beside some promise in the Bible. Well, one day, they finally got to the end, and they came to the last chapter of the last book of Revelation. And down at the bottom, she had written two, three, three words, tried and proved, tried and proved, tried and proved. Jesus has a perfect record. Every time he made a promise, he always kept it. So you're going through a tough time. You're going through a storm. You've got cancer. You're in a bad marriage. You've got a rebellious son. You've got a prodigal daughter. You, you've got financial difficulties. You've lost your job. You say, James, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't. But he does. And he made a promise. All things I will see to it will work together for your good. Remember the promise of Jesus. Here's the second thing. Rest in the presence of Jesus. Remember the promise of Jesus. Rest in the presence of Jesus. Now we're in verse 36. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Now, watch this next statement. There were also other boot, uh, boats with him. Also other boats with him with him. Now, Mark adds this to the story because the other gospel writers, forget to, they don't mention that in the story. But somehow, Mark wanted us to know, oh, by the way, there were other boats with him. In other words, there were, theirs was not the only boat on the sea that evening. There were a lot of little boats. There's like a little navy out there sailing across the sea. So I, I read that and I thought to myself, now, why would Mark add that detail? I mean, what does it matter? Who cares whether they were the only boat or there was two boats or 20 boats or 30 boats or 50 boats? What does it matter that they, that was not the only boat out there? And then it hit me. The reason why Mark wanted us to know, oh, by the way, that wasn't the only boat out there. He wanted us to understand there was one difference in that boat and all the other boats. What was the difference? Jesus was in that boat. That was the difference. Jesus was in that boat. Listen, here's the good news. When you become a follower of Jesus, he gets into the boat of your life. And when you get the Savior into your ship, your ship will be safe in the storm. Well, guess what happens? Immediately, they run into a storm, verse, verse, 30, verse 37. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. 
Now, you may wonder how this happens. I'm going to go back and tell you a true story that happened to me. It's only happened one time in all the times I've been. But we, we, this has been about, I don't know, about seven or eight years ago. We always, when we, when we take our little boat ride across the Sea of Galilee, when I lead a group over to Israel, we take the boat ride across the Sea of Galilee. We always leave at 8 o'clock in the morning. Seas are calm and, you know, it's pretty, usually beautiful. And this was no different than any other time we'd ever been over there. The sea was, I mean, it was just as calm. It was as smooth as glass. Sun was shining. wasn't a cloud in the sky. We get in the boat. It's about an hour boat ride from uh, Tiberias over to Capernaum. So we're, we're about halfway across, and I'm not kidding you, in about a two-minute span, all of a sudden, it was as dark as you can imagine. It started pouring buckets of rain. The boat began to rock back and forth. I mean, it was thundering, and it was lightning, and it, we were right in the middle of a storm. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, it wasn't 30 minutes we'd left. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Well, the captain of the ship, when I asked him, I said, man, what in the world, what happened? The Sea of Galilee is surrounded by, by mountains, by what we, not we would call them big hills, but they're, they call them mountains. It's surrounded by mountains. So when the cold air from the mountains hits that warm air from the sea, you can have a storm just like that. I mean, it can rise up just, just I mean, like that. And when he told me that, I thought to myself, you know, that's the way it is in life. You, you, you can be sailing along in the ship of your life, and the sea of circumstances are just as smooth as glass. Everything's coming up roses. Everybody's good. Everything's fine. You don't have a problem in your life. And then the phone rings. And the doctor says, your test came back with cancer. Or the phone rings. And it's a police officer. He says, I, I hate to tell you this, but your son's been killed in an automobile accident. Or you walk into a place of business where you've been working for 33 years and you've been a loyal employee only to find the locks on your door have been changed and you've been fired. And all of a sudden, without any forewarning at all, you are in the middle of a storm. Now, you see, Jesus knew something they didn't know. And Jesus saw something they didn't see. Now, this is, this is the hard part of the story. You got to read This is hard, but you got to hear me. Jesus knew that storm was coming. He saw the storm coming before they ever set sail. You say, how do you know that? Because nothing ever takes Jesus by surprise. You go read the Gospels. Jesus never goes, really? No way. Oops. Nothing ever takes Jesus by surprise. Yet, go back to the beginning of the story. He knows the storm is coming. He realizes it's about, to, I mean, the bottom's about to fall out. Yet he says to them, tells them, hey, let's cross over to the other side. Now buckle your seatbelt. The truth of the matter is there are times Jesus will lead you into a storm. There are times that Jesus will lead you into a storm. See, a lot of people think that when they run into difficulties in life, the first thing they think is they say, okay, what have I done wrong? Why is God upset with me? How in the world did I get out of the will of God? Evidently, I disobeyed the Lord somehow. I haven't pleased the Lord somehow, and he is really upset with me, and he's letting me out. Well, that's not true here. The disciples were not in the storm because they disobeyed Jesus. They were in the storm because they obeyed Jesus. He's the one that said, get into the boat. He's the one that said, set sail. He's the one that said, let's cross over to the other side. See, storms come to the innocent just as they come to the guilty. And many times, storms will come into your life, listen, not because you're doing what's wrong, but because you're doing what's right. I promise you, Jim and I, I can tell you, Jim will vouch for this. I have known pastors, Jim, that lost their churches, not because they were doing what was wrong, because they were doing what was right. I've known pastors that got fired because they stood up for what was right. And they, they were preaching too hard. They were preaching too strong. Or the people didn't like this. Or this bell cow deacon didn't like that or whatever. And it wasn't because they were sinning. It was because they were doing what they ought to do. And you're going to find out many times in your life, you're going to be in the middle of a storm, not because you were doing something wrong, but actually because you were doing something right. I read a story the other day. This, I love this story. There was this Ohio man that he was, he was an oil magnet and he owned an oil well and, and it caught fire. 
And he was watching all of his fortune just go up in flames. And so he put out this all points bulletin for help. He was asking anybody and everybody to come help him. As a matter of fact, he offered a $100,000 reward to anybody that could come and put out that fire. Well, all the large firehouses from cities like Newell and Chester and Wellsville and Dillonvale, they sent help. They sent their best companies. They had the most modern firefighting equipment available. But not one of those trucks could get within 200 yards of the blaze because the fire was so big and the heat was so intense. The man about giving up hope, he thought, man, my livelihood is gone. I'm going to go bankrupt. I'm going to go broke. And about that time, the tiny Calcutta Township Volunteer Fire Department appeared on the scene. They had one little rickety truck. It was equipped with a single ladder, only had two buckets of water, three buckets of sand, and a few blankets. Didn't even come with a hose. Well, when that old truck reached the point where all those other fire trucks had stopped, I mean, the driver didn't even hesitate. He didn't even slow down. He just kept barreling right ahead until he and his crew were right in the middle of that blaze. Everybody could not believe what they were watching. These, these, they, there were only five of these men. They jumped out of that truck threw the two buckets of water, the three buckets of sand on that fire, and then they got the blankets and beat the fire out with their bare hands. crowd couldn't get over it. That old man was so impressed by that unbelievable display of courage that on the spot, he wrote them out a check for $100,000. The captain of that fire truck was black and blue and still smoldering from the smoke of, of fighting that fire and shaking like a leaf. And he looked at him and he said, hey, What are you men going to do with all that money? And the driver, barely able to speak, said, I'll tell you the first thing we're going to do. We're going to get the stupid brakes on that truck fixed. That's what we're going to do. (laughs) You see, sometimes we're thrown into a fire that's not even our fault. Sometimes we barrel into a fire and we're pumping the brakes as fast as we can, but the brakes don't work. That's exactly where the disciples were. They're in the middle of a storm. It's not their fault. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were right in the center of the will of God. But here they are in that storm. Well, the ship is filling with water. The disciples are filling with worry, but not Jesus. Verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? By the way, did you know that's the only time in Scripture where you ever read that Jesus was asleep? Interesting. Never ever read another time where Jesus ever was asleep. So that raises a question. Why was Jesus at peace when the disciples were going to pieces? Why was it you couldn't find an ounce of worry on Jesus with a Geiger counter and they're all about to abandon ship? Well, it's because he remembered something, but they forgot something. He remembered I'm right where God wants me to be. He remembered that. They had forgotten Jesus was right beside them. My mentor, Adrian Rogers, used to say so often, there's no panic in heaven, just plans. God never walks the floor of heaven going, what am I going to do about this? I didn't know this was going to happen. I never anticipated this circumstance. There's no panic in heaven, just plans. But the disciples had to learn a lesson. There's no need to fear when Jesus is near. There's no need to fear when Jesus is near. Listen, your ship, I don't care how rough the storm is, listen listen to me. Your ship is safe in the storm if the Savior is in your boat. Your ship is safe in the storm if the Savior is in the boat. When Every time I read this passage of Scripture, I'm reminded of a lesson over and over and over. Listen, safety is not the absence of problems. Safety is the presence of Jesus. Safety is not the absence of problems. Safety is the presence of Jesus. So the next time you're buffeted by the tornado of trouble or you're in the hurricane of hurt, just remember, Jesus is always right beside you. He's always in the boat. There is no storm he cannot handle. So James, I'm I'm in the middle of the storm. (laughs) What do I do? Well, you remember the promise of Jesus. You rest in the presence of Jesus. And then here's the last thing. You rely on the power of Jesus. You rely on the power of Jesus. Verse 39, he got up. I love this part of the story. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, 
quiet. Be still. I'd love to have been there for that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that have been cool? Quiet. Be still. Now watch this. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. First, Jesus rebukes the wind. Very interesting. The word there used for rebuking the wind is the same word that is used for Jesus rebuking demons. Then he spoke to the sea. He said to the wind, quiet. He said to the waves, be still, which literally means to be muzzled. So you know what Jesus really said? You're going to love this. You know what Jesus really said to the wind and the waves? He said, sit down and shut up. That's what he said. That's literally what he said. Sit down and shut up. And as one great preacher said, the wind and those waves laid down at his feet like whipped puppies. You see, there were really two miracles that took place in one. There was the miracle of the storm, but there was also the miracle of the waves. Because you know this, if you, I just got back from Florida and I saw it happen. Normally, when the wind dies down in a storm, the waves will continue to roil and boil for hours. But in this case, not only the wind that, did the wind die down like that, the waves died down just like that. Psalm 107 verse 29 says, He stilled the storm to a whisper, the waves of the sea were hushed. Now, don't miss this next part. Because this is where a lot of people lose their faith. This is where a lot of people give up on God. This is where a lot of people throw in the towel. This is where a lot of people quit going to church. This is where a lot of people quit reading their Bible. This is where a lot of people quit going to God in prayer. I want you to notice, Jesus did not keep the storm from striking the boat. He only kept it from sinking the boat. When Jesus told them to cross over, he never promised them smooth sailing. He only promised them a safe landing. I got news for you particularly in the 21st century in which you're living, don't you sit there and think if you're going to stand for Jesus and walk with Jesus and talk for Jesus and be where Jesus wants you to be, you're going to get through it without any scars and any battle wounds and any blood whatsoever. Not in this day and not in this age. When you decide to take your stand on the Son of God and the Word of God, get ready. You just invited a storm to come. It's unfortunate in this case that, that, that this miracle is divided by a chapter ending. You know, when the Bible was originally written, there were no chapter endings. It was just one continuous narrative. Because when you go down, you know, one of the best parts of this story is when you go down and read chapter 5, verse 1. You know, we stop at Mark 4, 31, but when you go down and read chapter 5, verse 1, this is what you read. Listen to this. They went across the lake to the region of the garrison. And I, want to, I always add a little princess there in my Bible. Just like Jesus said they would. I told you we'd cross over to the other side. You didn't believe me. You didn't trust me. I know you didn't see the storm coming. But what did I tell you before you got in the boat? We're going to cross over to the other side. Now, Ray said all that now to say this. So what's the lesson of the story? Anytime you ever read a story in the Bible, I don't care whether it's the, you know, crossing the Red Sea. I don't care whether it's the flood. I don't care whether it's David killing Goliath. It doesn't matter. There's always a reason that God put that story in the Bible. There's always a lesson that God's trying to teach us. So here's my, here's my question. What is the lesson of the storm? What is Jesus trying to teach us? All right, we don't have to wonder. We come now to the real lesson of this story. It's found in the miracle, verse 40. But he said to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? There are two lessons in the story, and they're found in those two questions. All right, here's the lesson. There's a lesson about fear, and there's a lesson about faith. Here's lesson number one. Every time you face a storm, you will face it one of two ways. You'll face it with fear, or you'll face it with faith. You'll face it with trembling, or you'll face it with trust. Do you say, well, James, what's the difference? Real simple. Fear looks at the storm. Faith looks at the Savior. Fear looks at the storm. Faith looks at the Savior. 
You see, the greatest danger to the disciples was not the storm. The greatest danger was their doubt. Jesus rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. Listen, he did not rebuke them because they didn't have enough faith to still the storm. He rebuked them because they didn't believe he had the power to still the storm. That's why he rebuked them. They didn't believe that Jesus would take care of it. Because listen, fear cuts the legs of faith right out from under it. Nothing short circuits faith like fear. And the reason why Jesus, well, why was Jesus so irritated that, that, that they were afraid? He was so irritated that because they had no reason to fear. You know why? If you go back to Mark chapter 1 and read Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 2 and Mark chapter 3 and the first part of Mark chapter 4, they had already seen Jesus do miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. In Mark chapter 1, he cast out an unclean spirit. He healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. He healed an entire city of disease and demonic possession, and he cleansed a leper. In Mark chapter 2, he healed a paralytic. In Mark chapter 3, he restored a withered hand. So he had already proven, hey guys, if it's disease, I got that. If it's danger, I've got that. If it's demons, I've got that. I can handle any problem. So the reason why they were so afraid and the reason why we become so afraid is we forget what Jesus can do. We just forget it. Because you know what fear is? Let me give you this acronym. Fear is forgetting every available resource. That's what fear is. Forgetting every available resource. Second Timothy uh, says, for the Spirit of God... The spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out fear. It drives out fear. Again, there's no need to fear when Jesus is near. So lesson number one is, why are you so afraid? Why do you doubt I can do anything that you need me to do for you if it really needs to be done? But there's a second lesson. There's not just a lesson about fear. There's a lesson about faith. Because Jesus not only asked them, why are you so afraid? He asked them an even bigger question. Do you still have no faith? And if you're in the middle of a storm right now, can I just be honest with you? That's what Jesus is asking you right now. Why are you walking the floor? Why are you taking sleeping pills? Why are you having anxiety attacks? Why are you wringing your hands? Why have you, ta- why have you started taking blood pressure medication? Because you just don't really believe I can do what you need me to do. So I'm, I'm going to say something now that's really going to shake your world up a little bit, okay? And I don't like to say it. I don't like to admit it, but it's true. We need storms. You need storms. I need storms. And one of the reasons why God sometimes leads us into storms or why God allows us to walk into a storm or why God tells us to sail into a storm, you know what it does? It forces us to remember his promise. It forces us to rest in his presence. It forces us to rely on his power. I mean, nature itself tells you it's true. Give you an example. A tree, I don't know if you know this or not, but trees are planted in in rainforests. They're never forced to extend their roots downward because they don't need to search for water because they have all the water that they need. That's not a good thing because the weakest tree root system in the world are in rainforests and even a small breeze can blow over a big tree because they've never had to sink their roots deep into the ground so they can be blown over. However, you go out to Texas. Anybody here from Texas? Okay. They have a little tree out there called a mesquite tree. Let me tell you about a mesquite tree. It's planted in a dry desert. It's threatened by a hostile environment. The mesquite tree has to face unbearable heat, tremendous winds, sometimes extreme cold, but you can't kill it. You know why? Because even though the tree is not big, their roots go down over 30 feet in the ground because they're always looking for water. That's not good, but it is good because their roots are so deep into the soil, they can withstand all of the challenges of the desert, which is why one of the hardest trees to uproot 
is the mesquite tree. Listen, you know why God lets, you, lets us go through storms some, uh, uh, oftentimes? Can I tell you why? He wants us to know just how deep our roots are. Just how far does your faith really go into the ground? I said at the beginning of this message, you're either in the middle of a storm, you've just come out of a storm, you're about to get into a storm. And so the next time that storm hits and the next time you are just buffeted by the winds and the rain and the thunder and the lightning, and it seems like your world is collapsing around you, I just want you to remember this last story. In 1989, the country of Armenia had an earthquake. It only lasted four minutes, but it flattened that nation. It killed 30,000 people. Moments after that earthquake had stopped, a father who was at work realized what had happened, left his work, and went racing to the elementary school where his son went to school. When he arrived, he saw the building had been totally leveled. He looked at that mass of stones and that rubble, and his heart sank, and he got on his knees, he began to weep, and he began to cry until he remembered a promise that he always made to his little boy before he went to school. And here was the promise. No matter what happens, I'll always be there for you. No matter what happens, I'll always be there for you. And driven by that promise, that dad wiped his tears off of his cheeks. He got up, he shook his, got the dirt off of his hands. He went to where he thought his son's room might have been before that earthquake hit, and he began to pull back rocks. He began to dig out dirt. Well, other parents arrived, and they began sobbing for their children. They began to say things like, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? The kids are gone. The kids are dead. There's no hope. They're all, they've all been killed. It's too late. You know they're dead. You just give up. Even a police officer came and said, look, man, this is nuts. This is crazy. I, I know you loved your son. We loved our kids. I'm sorry. They're all gone. You just need to give up. But he didn't. And for eight hours, nonstop, that man dug. And for 16 hours, nonstop, that man dug. For 24 hours, nonstop, that man dug. For 32 hours, nonstop, that man dug. That man dug for 36 hours, nonstop, no sleep, no rest, 36 hours. His hands were raw, they were bleeding, his energy was gone, but he refused to quit. And finally, after 38 gut-wrenching hours, he pulled back this last voice of this last rock and he heard his son's voice and that dad said Armon Armon and the voice came back dad it's me dad it's me and then that little boy added priceless words that that dad said he will remember to the day that he died he said his son called back and he said dad I told the other kids not to worry I told them if you were alive, you would save me, and that when you saved me, we'd be saved too. And he said, son, what made you believe that? He said, because, Dad, you promised, no matter what happens to you, I'll always be there for you. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ died on a cross. He came back from the grave. He ascended into heaven. But he sent the Holy Spirit to make a promise. No matter what happens, I'll always be there for you. If your mama walks out on you, if your daddy walks out on you, if your wife walks out on you, if your husband walks out on you, if your kids turn your back on you, if your boss gives you the pink slip, doesn't matter, I will always be there for you. So you remember the promise of Jesus. You rest in the presence of Jesus. You rely on the power of Jesus. Because Jesus made a promise to us before we even drew our first breath. You know what he said to us? One day we will cross over to the other side.